Well, Rodney, thank you so much for joining us for our centenary celebration on Jerome Moross. And this is of great interest, particularly to have you on this programme. Now, you are English, of course, as I know only too well, having known you for, ooh, I think, 45 years or so now. Like myself, you're English. And I thought it would be very valuable for us, because you are a composer, and also you have composed a lot for the screen, for film, I thought it would be a very interesting perspective to hear from you how you feel Jerome Ross stands in the entire arena of the 20th century in terms of his musical achievement. And, in fact, you and I were just talking before we started this interview, weren't we, how he, from the word go, was different. And this originality and uh, individuality may have been one reason why it took him longer to be accepted, ironically, by Hollywood than most other people. I say ironically because, of course, he, in due course, became one of Hollywood's very, very most successful composers. But it would be nice to hear about all of that from your perspective and really from the historical outlook of how it was that Jerome Ross actually got to Hollywood, how it was that Jerome Ross began composing in Hollywood. Yes, uh, well, you have to put it into context, John. But Ross uh, never settled in Hollywood. He never considered himself a Hollywood composer by any means. He was a composer uh, of music largely for theatre, the ballet, which was his big interest. Um, he wrote musicals, one of which got uh, an award, and the concert hall, he wrote a symphony. Um, but I think first and foremost... Uh, all his music is, is balletic. I mean, uh, dance rhythms feature uh, throughout everything he seems to have done, even his symphony. Uh, you could choreograph it, and his film scores. I mean, even a, uh, an archetypal Western score like the, the Big Country you could actually make a ballet out of it. The, the music skips along. The, there's um, dance rhythms everywhere. So I think that was where he was coming from, as they say. Um, he went to... Hollywood in the 40s following the uh, the failure of, of uh, a Broadway show of his that didn't do at all well. He needed the money. And um, his friends, like uh, Aaron Copeland, uh, suggested that he should try his luck with Hollywood. However, uh, going there in those days, he wasn't well received there to start with. He couldn't find any work as a composer. Uh, however, he did orchestrate for other people, including um, Hugo Friedhofer and uh, and his friend Aaron Copeland. He, he orchestrated Our Town for them and became well known as a very fine orchestrator. Um, I think you have to realise that he was a very well-educated young man. He'd uh, he'd gone through the Juilliard, he'd gone through New York University, he'd got his uh, bachelor's degree when he was only 17 years old, and that was unbelievable. He, in fact, he graduated from high school when he was 10, and he was a real, um, almost a genius in a way. He was certainly a protégé. He was composing by the age of five. And, of course, he was a lifelong friend of Bernard Herrmann. But his music was very, very different to Benny's, lacking the uh, the sort of the neurotic um, darkness of much of Herman's scores. His music was always very easy on the ear, I find. Um, uh, his, his early scores, when he, when he first started to uh, get feature films, the first one, for instance, was a film called Close Up, which was directed by Jack Donahue, which is about two uh, two reporters unwittingly photographed a long dead somebody they thought was a long dead Nazi leader. It doesn't even feature in Halliwell's film guide, so that was a very undistinguished start. Uh, but he did then go on to work with better directors. Robert Wise, his film um, *The Captive City*, which is about a newspaper editor exposing mafia corruption, um, was a pretty good B film uh, and. Uh, um, not something that he needed to be ashamed of. And then, of course, he went on to work with uh, Michael Curtiz on um, The Proud Rebel, which was uh, rather a formulaic family western. But nevertheless, he was working with good people by then. But uh, by 1958, um, he'd, gone, he'd begun to work then 
with some really top talents like William Wyler, who of course engaged him on the on the big country. And the importance of that score is that it broke the mould of the Hollywood uh, Western score, which hitherto uh, the big epics have been scored by uh, people like Dmitry Tiomkin and um, Waxman and Max Steiner and so on, uh, all of whom uh, had European training and their music uh, was very clearly rooted in European influences. Here came a composer whose raison d'etre, as it were, was that of his friends Copeland and uh, George Gershwin, who drew their influences from the music they heard around them. With uh, Gershwin it was jazz, with Copeland it was uh, f the, the folk idiom, and he did the same. And here for the first time was a major Western score which was using a p purely American idiom unencumbered by uh, the influences of, uh, of Europe. Um, the way, in fact, the um, opening theme came about was interesting. You may well have read this account, but he was on his way to um, California by a very circuitous route, it seems, and in, he arrived in New Mexico and he was so taken by the extraordinary landscape, these huge great plains bounded by mountains, that he, he stopped off on his bus journey and he stayed over for a whole day sightseeing. And when he came to write the music for the big country, and then he saw that opening sequence with the stagecoach rolling across the plain sort of thing, his mind went back to that experience. And he said, I, I drew on that early experience. And all that music comes out of uh, that early encounter with the, um, with the landscape. And uh, that's when it started, I think. Yes, I so much think that is a vital element that you've just described there. That was the love of his country so much, the natural elements of his country so much, that affected him as well as the people. But the, the nature which perhaps inspired him to create his musical language into which he put the people didn't he, so brilliantly that he described in his theatrical works and in his films as well. I wonder if you would like to give me your view on my little theory, which I've asked most people and had very varying responses, that despite the unmistakable American quality of Jerome Moross, the famous American quality of Jerome Moross, I think, for me, there's something even uh, extra there which to me uh, somehow is uh, coming from his Russian Jewish heritage. Now, it's difficult to put my finger on it, but some of the harmonies, some of the melancholy, the wistfulness, the poignancy um, seems to me to be European. But I may be dreaming this because of what I know about him. So as you're a composer... I think it would be very interesting to hear what you think about that. And please don't hesitate to contradict me if you think I'm completely wrong. Well, it could be a, what they call a racial memory. Yeah, I mean, we're all the sum of our parts, aren't we? You know, and um, I think there is something in that. I mean, the point is that he didn't grow up in isolation. He grew up listening to music, a lot of which he learned with uh, as a as a, a schoolboy with his friend Bernard Herrmann. They they uh, had a, a piano trio together, you know. And Bernard played the uh, was a fine violinist. His brother Lewis was a cellist, and um, Ross was a prodigious pianist. I mean, he was uh, uh, George Gershwin personally engaged him for the first tour of Porgy and Bess. Uh, he was a fantastic pianist, and uh, they together they played through and learned the chamber music repertoire for um, piano trio, which was quite uh, considerable. And they were only in the teens. Well, yes, that was actually rather a remarkable relationship that uh, Jerome Ross had with Bernard Herrmann. I mean, they were very different people indeed, but they, they, they got on uh, remarkably well, except actually I believe at the beginning that they didn't, but, but uh, very quickly they did. Well, he recounted the fact that um, his... <laughs> His first encounter with the young Bernard Herman started with a fight in a classroom. 
<laughs> they then became lifelong friends. And uh, Herman suggested, let's let's go and listen to the New York Philharmonic rehearse. He said, well, how did we get into Carnegie Hall? Oh, I know where there's a broken door. And they crept into... into <laughs> Carnegie Hall to watch the rehearsal. They were found by the manager and were were going to be ejected when the conductor said, I'll let them stay <laughs> because they all had the scores in their hands, you see. And they, they were only school kids, only about 14, 15 years old. And, uh, you know, that's how they learned their music at, at the actually at the feet of the great conductors. That's how you did in those days. Oh, very much so, because that rehearsal, the New York Philharmonic were rehearsing Strauss's Ein Heldenleben, and the conductor was none other than Willem Mengelberg. It was Mengelberg, that's right. Uh, but they got to know uh, Brunner Walter and all the others, and, and they went to uh, they were allowed into Toscanini rehearsal. Well, I don't know whether they were allowed in, but they gate crashed them. And I wonder whether they might have possibly seen that year a great conductor making his debut with the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, Sir Thomas Beecham, 1928. I don't know whether they did, but there's a link. Beecham was to become, of course, one of the Philharmonic Orchestra's very, very favourite guest conductors. But the link, of course, is, isn't it, that um, 15 years later, if my mathematics is correct, in 1943, it was Beecham who gave the first performance of Moross's First Symphony. Now, that's a work that I think Moross was actually particularly fond of, I Am Too. It's a most enchanting and very brilliant and very individual work indeed. Well, the first symphony, that again is um, quite an extraordinary piece in the fact that it's 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 almost light music. It's ballet music. It's dance music. The whole thing skips along. Uh, it, even the slow movement, you, you could choreograph it very easily. And uh, Beecham saw it and he liked it. He... Um, uh, he showed it to Sir Thomas, uh, uh, gave him a copy of the score, and he took it away. And he thought, well, that's you know, that's that. At least I've uh, I've made the effort. And all of a sudden, uh, the orchestra manager at Seattle rang up and said, "Oh, Sir Thomas is doing this next season. Uh, can you tell me how how we get hold of the parts? Well, there weren't any, so he was working in Hollywood at the time, and he engaged a whole army of Hollywood uh, copyists at his own expense to um, sort of cost him an arm and a leg to copy the parts out hurriedly, and uh, the piece was. Uh, performed and then it was uh, broadcast by the um Los Angeles Philharmonic I can't remember who the um the conductor oh I know it was it was Alfred Wallenstein he took it up he he performed it with the Los Angeles Philharmonic but for the first broadcast of the piece uh, you you know that he he'd written quite a florid piano part and <laughs> the pianist was taken ill and he had to substitute himself in his own piece <laughs> playing this this concerto standard piano part you see but um, it, it did. That was that actually sort of um, established him as a serious uh, composer, albeit one um, whose music, like as I say, like, like, like Gershwin, drew on the the lighter music of, of the that he heard around him. Yes, I think something that is very strongly evident when we listen to Jerome Moross's music is this open. Honesty. Now, that's not a good description of what I'm trying to say. It just bears relation to what you've just said about him expressing what he heard around him in the United States, particularly the feeling of um, a more popular kind of music, which he nevertheless, uh, if you like, um, included in certain ways in his works in often a much deeper way, I think. But there is that openness. There's no sense of trying to be uh, pretentiously over-serious or, for that matter, over-popular, which I think can happen very easily when one is a serious composer and is hearing something lighter around one. No, it was extraordinarily natural. I think that's what I'm trying to say. His musical expression was extraordinarily natural, and you have that in the films, whether the subjects are American or of other genres in terms of the stories and the places. It always feels very real and natural, almost a kind of American verismo. It's never trying to be something else, is it? Oh, no, no, not at all. It's, it's un totally unpretentious. Totally unpretentious. He, he never tries it on at all. No, I, I, I thoroughly agree with you there. Um, he, he 
did express his disappointment with uh, a lot of the the films he did in Hollywood because of the interference of outside people like the producers and so on, who were forever cutting his stuff around and mixing it up and down so you could hardly hear it, you know, and he, he just got fed up with it in the end. But I, I don't think if you read any of the, the comments of... Um, Suzanne about her father or anybody else that he, that he ever expressed any bitter resentment like Herman who, who considered that he was he was going to be a great conductor you see yes Maros had a wonderfully gentle and unassuming personality strong we hear this in the interviews he's given us strong-minded wonderfully strong-minded but he wasn't somebody to push himself and um, I think that may be one reason, perhaps, why he was treated badly in Hollywood. I mean, he, the I know that many of the composers were pushed around by the industry and the management and the editors, but I, I think he particularly, especially because of the quality of his music, I think he particularly had a rough time in many cases. I mean, for instance, I think one instance which was... Uh, particularly difficult for him was The Warlord. Now, that is a wonderful score. And many people in this series of interviews that we're doing for his centenary have said how extraordinarily evocative and original it is, um, evoking so strongly the medieval feudal atmosphere of the, of the Middle Ages. But, of course, that was one film where he really was messed about, wasn't he? And an awful lot of what he composed was cut really in, in unforgivable ways. It must have had an awful effect on him. Well, no, the, the film wasn't the best of all the films either because it had been mercilessly cut about by the studio. And uh, the, the original plan of Maross and Franklin Schaffner and Chuck Heston uh, was to have a film that concentrated on the love story aspect. So it was a great big sprawling three-hour epic originally and, uh, and didn't have the kind of usual heavy music that you had with the, 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 the action sequences. He said, the Schaffner said, well, they're noisy enough, we don't need it, you see. But unfortunately, the studio disagreed, cut the film down by an hour, and then uh, after Maross had left the picture, after, after, the, after they'd all left the picture, got Hans Salter in, who was the house composer at Universal, to rescore some of it uh, and to add heavy battle music, which just turned it in, into a very humdrum, rather impenetrable epic, historical epic, um, whose storyline was obscured by the fact that you'd, half of it was missed out. <laughs> It, it, was a, it was a mess, in other words, exactly the same way that um, some of his other films were, were, were cut about like that. And I, I think he was more disappointed and he sort of, you know, resigned to, oh, well, that's the way it is, you know, which is why he didn't do many movies. Yet he did 16, you know. Yes, well, he wasn't, was he, a kind of person who could just turn things out in a formulaic style for an industry. He had to be inspired by the subject and he had to feel emotionally involved. So he was much more picky, I think, don't you, than many of the other people there. He was a very sensitive person. This comes through, as I say, on these interviews we have with him. He, he's strong. He's no pushover. He's impressive, but he's sensitive. And I think that that would have been very, very difficult for him uh, in, in Hollywood. But I think, you know, one of the wonderful qualities is that despite that, uh, we have these wonderful scores which rise above, it seems to me, the stature, really, of many film scores. These are great works of art, so many of them, and, and all of them, don't you think? Despite all the difficulties he had to go through, all of them so individualistically different because of the way that he always used to respond to the subject and the people and the atmosphere of the place and, in fact, just the psychological situations that were going on in the films. Mm -hmm. no, I, and I do think you touched on a very important point there by calling attention um, to his sensitivity. 
the the music the orchestration um which i presume he had help with in in hollywood as he helped other people that that's not, that isn't because they can't orchestrate well i think it is today but uh, in those days they were all fine orchestrators they often started as orchestrators but it was just the time scale they just didn't have time to write out of 35 stave scores you know so they 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 would do a short score as, as john williams does he does a short score then he hands it over to someone who flushes it out and uh, adds in all the other 104, you know, 104 instruments and so on, you know, and uh, th th that's why they use them. But um, you'll find with, with, with him, everything really is pretty tasteful. I mean, even something like the Valley of Guanji, which he um, sort of descends into kind of Max Steiner, King Kong music. There's a tastefulness in, in, in the orchestration and in the cues. It all works very, very well. Um, now, that uh, film interests me very much in the fact that it was a Charlie Schneer, Ray Harryhausen film. Now, Ray, who I knew very well, of course, he died um, a few days ago. Uh, I knew Ray Harryhausen very well, and he had a great deal of say in in who was engaged on those pictures and they were very much his pictures regardless of the fact they might have Raquel Welch in them and so on they were his films and he had the say in, in often entirely in who was engaged as a composer he engaged Bernard Herrmann he engaged Miklos Rocha and I'm pretty damn sure he would have engaged Jerome Moros possibly on Bernard Herrmann's recommendation and he was a great Max Steiner fan so he, he probably would have said, look, uh, uh, Jerome, can you do something like uh, Max did in King Kong? But which, of course, he, he worked with, uh, um, uh, you know, Ray worked with Willis O'Brien on Mighty Joe Young, the, 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 uh, the second film he did. So uh, I, I, think, I think, John, there's a huge um, connection there. That, that's what interests me about that picture, not so much the film itself or even the music that was written for it, but the, the connection of those artists very valuable point because the history of Jerome Moross's life and career is about remarkable people that he was connected with and this is something that I'm very strongly wanting to um, emphasize during the documentary and in fact during all the archiving of these interviews he had a very colorful life and uh, again I go back to the interviews that we have with him he has wonderful stories about all sorts of people Bertolt Brecht, Kurt Weill, uh, George Antile and uh, these sorts of people that uh, you're talking to us about so Rodney, Rodney Newton thank you very much I think that's really covered everything we could want from you really good to have you doing this for us and uh, in the Jerome Moros centenary it's very valuable indeed to have had your particular perspective which is, is really quite different I think from many other people who've been contributing to the programme thank you very very much indeed for joining us appreciate it very much indeed my pleasure